Um, Madam Clerk, at this time, we will call the meeting of the Community Homeless Advisory Board together December 7th, 2020. Um, we will start off, Madam Clerk, with the roll. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Jordan? Here. Elgato absent. Dare? Here. Lawson? Here. Bert Bigler? Here. Lucy is absent. And Madam Chair, as noted, you do have a quorum of the Homeless Advisory Board as a reminder to all those present. Um, if we do need to have anyone step away, we will need to take a recess as we do have the minimum for quorum today of four of our members present. Thank you very much. At this time, we're gonna move into the Pledge of Allegiance and Mr. Stockham, would you lead us in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay, we are back at it. All right, Madam Clerk, uh, we are moving on now to item three, public comment. Madam Chair, public comment is uh, for this item identified as general public comment not pertaining to a specific item on our agenda. As a reminder to the public, public comment can be received either by submitting an online public comment form found at reno.gov forward slash public comment, sending an email to cityclerk at reno.gov or by way of leaving a voicemail, which will be heard through this meeting. Uh, that phone number is 393-4499. It should be noted for the record, Madam Chair, no public comment was received by my office. Thank you very much. Uh, moving into item four, approval of the agenda. May I get a motion? So moved. I have a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries unanimously. Item five, the approval of the minutes. May I get a motion? Move approval. I have a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries unanimously. Item six, board update on Our Place, uh, Women and Family Shelter. Great uh, materials in the packet on this, by the way. Um, okay. I'm not sure who is up on this one. I think Amber is supposed to be on. I think she's moving on. There's Ashley, you're on now. We see you. <laughs> but I don't see Amber. Okay, Madam Clerk, are we having trouble getting Amber on? Madam Chair, we are moving Amber Howell over right now as a panelist. And she will be able to give her presentation, Amber. Uh, we do have you unmuted on our end, so you'll be able to present your slides. Additionally, we do have Kate Thomas from the county available to answer questions as well. Fantastic. Perfect, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So Ashley, are you bringing, do you bring up the presentation? Uh, normally, Amber, we allow you to be able to share your screen so you can migrate through your slides on your own. If you are not able to do that, I can advance them for you. It just takes a minute to get there. Yes, if you could do that because I'm really bad at that. Okay, <laughs> give me just one second. I have not figured that out yet. <laughs> While she's doing that, we did get a notification. I don't know if all of you saw that. It was from Dias Dixon saying, uh, saying our numbers are up 40% at Eddie House and the Our Place site. I'm assuming that means resident. I just wrote him asking for clarification. Yeah, because he said site that threw me off like a website site. I, I think he means individuals uh, seeking assistance at those locations, but I'm not sure. So that's the nice feature of this chat. We can get hopefully data quickly before the end of the meeting. 
And councilman, I'll be a uh, councilwoman. I'll be able to answer that question for you in the Great. presentation. Thank you. Okay, Amber, I have your presentation up. You may go ahead and begin whenever you are ready. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. For the record, Amber Howell. I'm the director of the Washoe County Human Services Agency. This morning, I wanted to give a presentation about our place. Um, just kind of a little bit of history. I won't bore you with that. I know you guys are all familiar with the campus, but those of um, you are members of the public who, who aren't, um, just as a reminder, our place is located at the Northern Nevada Adult Mental Health Campus. And originally it was opened in the 1800s uh, to serve those um, with mental illnesses. Um, even before uh, Sparks was a city, um, that's how long ago uh, this campus opened. And so what's been happening at the campus uh, for a couple of past decades is, is really a lot of nothing, um, a lot of opportunity in buildings on the campus um, with not a lot of life. Um, and so we set out to um, create a happy campus uh, for those populations, um, realizing that our um, people experiencing homelessness was growing in the community. So just to recap on um, slide three, the goals were, were simple at first. Um, first was to separate the populations to increase safety, uh, to separate po populations so we could have a more targeted approach um, based on genders, age, uh, family dynamics. And with that, taking proven effective treatment modalities um, for men and women and really being able um, to put those on high gear to figure out um, what we needed to do differently um, with all of these vulnerable individuals. So um, the goal, the final goal was to increase services, especially at intake. Um, increase mental health, and then, of course, decrease the incidences that involved police, REMSA, and the MOST team at the homeless shelters in our community. So we can move on to slide four. Um, I won't go into um, all of the scope and funding other than to, to summarize and say that the entire project that we have done so far has redesigned nine, bu nine buildings um, that are considered the Our Place campus uh, for, named after William Place, uh, who was the first that was laid to rest um, at, at the campus uh, years ago. And Washoe County had a total investment of $14.7 million. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about some of our expansion efforts. So uh, we have changed the map on slide five a multitude of times, uh, depending on the influx and the patterns that we're seeing in the data. You will notice that all of the blue is the R Place facilities. The yellow is Crossroads. So that's a second level of care. Um, the R Place campus becomes the pipeline um, to, an, to uh, the first level of treatment um, or <clears throat> experience hopefully moving into the cottages. Um, the Eddie House is 8C. That is a mixture of an emergency shelter and substance abuse programming and mentally health. It houses 36 beds. Uh, for individuals that are 18 to 24 years old. Um, one wing is for men, one is for women. Um, that is what Diaz was speaking about, that we are up 40% uh, in that facility. It opened in October, so we're, we're getting some good numbers in there. Um, and then you will also see two uh, items on this map that um, talk about modulars, that that's gonna be for the intake and for dining, so that we have a specific dining area. And then 2A um, was originally thought to be used for women and family overflow, uh, but we're looking at 8B, um, which is the family, women and family overflow and expanding that for 10 additional families, which I'll talk about later and show you some of the data that we're seeing um, around this population based on our capacity 
and the needs of those <clears throat> who are without shelter. So moving on to slide seven. Just a, <clears throat> a little bit of a recap along with the $14.7 uh, million. There were 25 new positions that were created uh, within the Human Services Agency. Seven, of, of course, were caseworkers. That was a major focus for us. Uh, there's uh, three support specialists, a mental health therapist, and APRN, and I'll talk about why those positions are so important, along with a, a congruent contract with uh, RISE is our vendor for 64 staff. When um, we started building the Our Place campus, we were able to double the capacity of the women that are able to stay within shelter at the Record Street Shelter, they, they were able to provide 50 beds. And when we opened our place, we expanded that to 102. So we doubled the capacity uh, for the Our Place campus. And then we were able to fully accommodate the in, entire 28 families that were at the Record Street Shelter. Um, but I think it's important for today's discussion and all of the different um, opportunities and initiatives that we have going on as a region to realize that we are full um, within the women's facility and the family facility. And we're seeing a couple of additional trends, uh, which I think is important for us to pay attention to, to as we go on and expand in other sites and areas within the community. So I want to, on slide eight, I wanna focus my presentation on the critical components of, of, of the Our Place model. As most of you will remember, there was an analysis that was done um, on the residents at the CAC back in 2019, I believe it was, it seems like forever ago, um, really to start understanding what is it that our guests are coming in with, what is their conditions upon entry, and what is their conditions upon exit to figure out what, what needs to be infused within during their stay within an emergency shelter to increase services, resources, and barriers um, to address uh, why the individual is experiencing homelessness and really how to get them out of homelessness. And so there's really, uh, we, we found about uh, four, the top four um, that we have identified that were areas of significant barriers uh, to people seeking shelter and, um, and getting to the next level within their independence. So pets was a, was a big deal. We've, we've talked a lot about this. Um, not being able to have their pets there, uh, personal property and safety, uh, feeling safe on the campus. Of course, case management um, is a significant issue and, and case plans as well. Um, and so when you have pet safety, case management, and then case plans, so you have a good track um, of, of what they're doing during their stay, it really aids in more participation. If you can remove the barriers to why somebody may not be seeking shelter, uh, if you can take care of their safety, um, make sure that they have their companion with them um, and, and those types of things. And so what we have done is we've created a model based on these foundational fixes. And then we also have found that needing to increase the length of stay, um, it would be very difficult. We see this on the child welfare side and in our adult populations, for someone who has a history of chronic homelessness to completely change their, my, their lives and move into self-sufficiency if they're only able to stay there for three months. And so we have extended that stay to six months as we feel that's a better amount of length of time as long as they're productive with their case plans, um, that that really gives them a good solid uh, half of a year to get things um, in order and support. It takes a while to start engagement and trust. And so increasing that length of stay um, has, been, has been significant. We will also show you later on that residents having their own space uh, that's theirs so that every night they don't go to a different bed or a different bedroom so that they have their own location that they can set up and put all of their possessions in their property um, gives them a feeling of safety and belongingness and so that has really assisted us as well. Um, and then of course, the, the other piece is the, inten the intensive intake. So what we have found is, this is really the most crucial piece of the program. Um, 
in order to prevent the overuse of other agencies, outside agencies. Most law enforcement, REMSA, jail, figuring out what are all of the, the makeups and the, the barriers um, to someone coming into the shelter and leaving um, the shelter that we really need to get a good idea on, on what are the things that they wanna work on. This is a person-centered approach. So they choose what they wanna work on. And then of course we give lots of encouragement and guidance on um, things that we believe they should work on. And sometimes it starts very basic. They don't have a driver's license. They don't have Medicaid. Um, something as simple as that. And so um, right upon entry into the, to the campus, they, are, um, they undergo an intensive intake screening assessment. And then um, right after that, they get assigned a caseworker um, that is with them during their entire stay. And um, the, uh, there is a case plan that is developed and that case plan is worked on um, and monitored and looked at and checked in on every single week for their entire stay. Um, and so the other piece, of course, of the campus is that it's completely fenced, there's security. Um, this is an important component because 75% of the women uh, that are on the campus have a history of domestic violence. And so understanding that data um, and that trauma is important uh, for us. We also invested in a full-time mental health counselor who can intervene and de-escalate individuals that are experiencing uh, stressful situations or things that they're having difficulty reconciling. Uh, this mental health counselor has probably been one of the key um, um, inclusions that we've made into this program. Um, she's fabulous um, in and of herself. Um, she, she's just a, a great um, staff member of ours. But what this also does is gives the um, individuals and the guests someone that they can go to uh, to try and, and de-escalate uh, to prevent them getting arrested. Um, what we're most proud about though, is that because of this um, investment in the mental health counselor, we have not had even one um, visit from the MOST team that has come to our campus. And if you, we remember um, when we were doing the analysis a couple of years ago, the MOST team was um, visiting the CAC campus at least three times a day. And we know that when they're doing that, we're taking away from other needs in the communities because it, the community, because the most team is, is spending a lot of time at the shelter. And so this is an area of an investment that was that is worth every dollar. Um, and then of course we have peer-to-peer -peer supports, Crossroads graduates fill this role. This is an important piece because it's not a case manager or somebody telling them what to do. They can um, start building healthy peers and friendship and healthy connections. And so that's been a, a very significant piece uh, that the, the RISE staff help us with. I'm gonna stop and make sure no one has any questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Lord, uh, Mayor Lawson. So Ash, when, when you go, when I end up at, at the Our Place campus, taking six months to basically put me back out in my own housing or I mean tell me that is there another step before they're out in the community so what we have learned is that it's really not a one-size-fits-all and what success will be for that individual we are learning so much about the number of individuals that have um, quite significant mental health issues um, where the the path of discharge would be to a group home within the community um, based on that. Can they ever live independently based on, you know, what, what their, their challenges are. Um, a lot of them go into permanent housing. Um, we'll show you later on um, that those outcomes are there too. Family reunif reunifications happen between moms and dads and their children. They may move to the Crossroads program. They may move to the TADS program. So there's probably about nine different exit points that someone could go to that are all a successful discharge um, from the program. But we are, we are uh, monitoring the recidivism to see and make sure um, that we don't have this, this Wait, ongoing Amber, discharge and then coming back in. Amber, can you hold for a moment? One of our members has to... Uh, Commissioner Burke, can we get the screen back? She needs to step away for a moment, so we have to put the meeting on pause.
because we've lost quorum. Okay. Sorry, somebody's at banging on my front door. I'll be right back. <laughs> it's the police. Madam Chair, just noting for the record that we're in recess as of 929 due to a dropped quorum and we will come back. Thank you. Sorry, I'm back. My grandson, he couldn't find me. <laughs> no, what can I say? <laughs> he found you. Um, okay, Th thank you very much. Um, and Mayor Lawson, I'm not sure if, if you had another question, if that answered your question or if it was complete, I apologize. Just uh, follow up <clears throat> is, Amber, do, do, we, uh, do we have enough places for them to go once they graduate from the from the our place, are, are we missing a piece of this in any, so, any area that we could yeah, work on? That's that's a that's a great question, um, and that's why this data is so important to start capturing to figure out what the exits look like. There are uh, there are two significant um, bottlenecks, I will say, um, from an exit strategy from our place. One is not having enough mental health placements in the community. Um, as many of you have heard over the years, there's been a ton of um, reduction in the state's mental health group homes in the community um, and places for individuals to go. Um, sometimes it depends on their level of independence, whether it's just someone checking in on them once a, once a week or someone every day. Um, that is a major, major barrier um, to people ever um, leave, leaving the campus, we have found a, a number of women that are doing really well. They're sober. Um, they have their social security and their income. They work a part-time job or something. They're great residents, and but just having the structure helps them so much. And if we um, discharge them from the program and there's nowhere else for them to go, um, that becomes a pretty dangerous situation. So that's probably our biggest challenge is lack of mental health placements. And then I would say the second is just affordable housing. Very difficult to get enough um, housing <clears throat> units for these individuals. Um, six months isn't a lot of time to save up money, uh, especially if you don't get them right at the, the first month um, of you know wanting to, to live independently. So I would say those two issues are our major um, major, major barriers. Uh, Crossroads is a great um, soft landing for them. Um, Tad's program, Eddy House, those types of areas. Uh, but those two are, um, they're significant and they're mighty. Um, and it doesn't look like there's anything on, on the horizon to fix those areas. So that's a great question. What do you say the, the percentage of mental health issues are in our place right now? So um, those that are experiencing mental health, we, we have a slide on that, um, but it is 64%. Holy cow, okay. Wow. I have a um, 
uh, Council Madera. Yes, uh, thank you so much. That was a lot of very good information and thank you for all the hard work. I know that all those things you just talked about take a lot of people and a lot of focus. So a uh, couple of things I just wanna congratulate and just really continue to say what, even what you just said, caseworkers, caseworkers, caseworkers. It's the problem uh, we kind of have, if you look at our region of what we've done in the past, it just seems like we are, do not have what we need in place to see people move forward. A little concern I had just, just in, I understand that people may need six months, but in the past, it seems that we have created a situation that people just stay in place for not just six months because everyone cares for people. So after six months and nothing's changed, now all of a sudden it's a year and we've seen this. So I'm not saying you guys have done this. This is just what we know. And, and, and what we, well, so far what our history tells us, um, expand the six months, are we just, I don't want to say it this way. Are we just tricking ourselves and trying to act like we're actually moving six months or is there things in place that really help move things forward? I, I just don't, I'd rather bite onto what's the reality of what we're dealing with and a hope that's not real. So I just, I just, what do you think on that? And I have, I have a couple other things I just want to bring up, but could, yeah. could, what's your thoughts on that? That's a, that's a great question. We contemplated the length of stay uh, for a long time we have a lot of experience on the child welfare side um, with length, length of stay, um, research around readiness, um, those types of areas. I, I will assure you that they are not allowed to stay um, past the three months if there are not successes and achievements made by them. Um, so when I mentioned the staffings happening every week, that if there is someone who is so, sort of idling um, and isn't getting to the next step or actively participating in their case plan, they don't get the extra three months. And, and I say that I'm not trying to be hurtful to anybody, but if they're going to linger there, there's probably somebody else who might be able to actually move forward and get off the streets and really get their life moving forward if they're going to do the work of it. And I, and I know all those things are complicated. We, we easy to talk in a meeting and say, hey, six months, but six months is not that long. For someone no, make- and, and what we also do is if they discharge, RISE has a multitude of programs that they have outside of our place, as do we. And so it may be that they are discharging from the our place campus, but they are not discharging from complete care and support from one of our agencies. So okay. they, they still have something and there is there has to be an appropriate and safe discharge plan. That's good. A couple of things you said, I think it's great that you're con- contemplating what to do with pets because that is definitely a barrier. Uh, the uh, one concern I had also, just because this, when you, we say that we're going to help people hold their stuff, um, our, that seems like we could be creating a monster because depending on who it is, they could sometimes have a lot of stuff and then we take responsibility and then we're, our, and I only say this just because people are going to ask us this, are we yeah uh, what does that mean <laughs> that that seems like that could be uh, i've seen some of the stuff when i walk by i'm like that person has so much wow you know kind of thing what do they have a limited space is 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 there limited time is it is there any rules to that just in the sense of how we handle that yes we have wardrobes um clothing wardrobes that they can put their items in there are see-through bins where they can put their their valuables or um, medication that is locked they have the key um, so it's up to them to to keep their stuff secured and they have to have a reasonable amount of possessions um, in their living location if they have other things like if someone's moving out they need a place to store things for their home um, we have four storage units on the campus so we put them, um, in there, or some of them is, is just a part of um, having them let go of some of those items, but it cannot, it cannot be cluttered in there. It can't be a fire hazard. It has to be gone through for safety and, and all those kinds of things. And later on in the presentation, I can show you um, what their areas look like and where they have to store their things. Very cool. And then my final thing, just give your props. I appreciate hearing all, all everyone really working together. I think that that if there's anything that we've seen in the last couple of years is the communications getting better and better between all parties. And I, I can't tell you, I think that's the only way we'll move anything forward. So thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I have a comment also. 
Commissioner Berkeley. Thank you. Um, you know, Amber has done yeoman's work on behalf of all of us here um, in the county on this issue. Without Amber, I don't know that we would have been able to pull this together as as in such an outstanding manner. And I, I just wanna make sure that as this is my last meeting with CHAB and, and um, make sure that Amber knows how much I appreciate all the information she's supplied and how hard she's working on this whole issue. This is a fabulous, fabulous model, I think for the entire country. And um, I hope that, and I know that, especially Naoma, with you and with Ed and, and with Christopher, all of you guys still working hard on this, I know that this is going to become an even better model and that we will resolve a lot of the issues here in Washoe County and throughout our area. So good luck. Thank you, Amber. Please continue the good work. I know you will. And I will be in touch with you because this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart and I don't intend to go away. Thank you. thank you very much. Yes, and thank you for um, not going away. You've been instrumental in <laughs> some very key decisions, some tough decisions, and uh, but you you too see the um, long term vision, and I, I appreciate you more than you know, Commissioner Berkeley. Um, Amber, could you go back to? I don't know that it was a slide; it was more comment. Um, <clears throat> you talked about being full. Um, yes. And, and struggling with intake with the uh, increase um, in need for services and shelter. So what is, and I know this is something you've struggled with since it opened and, and we struggle with it at the men's shelter all the time as well. So what, what is happening if, with this increase? Where, is there an emergency? I know you guys are talking about more of an emergency shelter intake to help address some of this, is that? I mean, are you having to turn people away? What's what's happening with the women and families that there's not a space for them? So that's a, a great question. Um, you know, when we designed this, we thought if we do 102 beds and there was only 50, surely we'll have enough room. Um, and so that was that was a, a, a safe projection. Um, and um, we're not seeing that. Um, I think. I, we are at, um, we're almost at an impasse right now because we're very full. Um, but we also have, um, which I'll show you later in the presentation, a number of exits that are happening. So the goal is, has always been for this model is that not only do we need to reduce recidivism, but we need to reduce the numbers continuing to grow in the community that are homeless. And so the thought is the model is designed to have enough churn um, that you're not constantly adding 30 more beds, 50 more beds, 100 more beds, another side over here, another side, you know, so we're hoping um, based on the projection that we have of those that are exiting and are on track because we're analyzing both every week um, that we're going to stabilize the entries and exits so we don't have um, a huge increase with nowhere for people to go. So and to answer your question, if they come to our place and we are full, we are providing them an outreach specialist. They're getting a case manager. We are putting them in another safe location. Um, we're not saying that, sorry, the door's closed, nowhere for you to go. We are, we are purchasing and, and paying for alternative placements until we can watch the churn happen. I got it. And we're all suffering through this and COVID obviously has uh, doubled our uh, issues surrounding homelessness. And, and my fear is it's gonna get worse before it gets better with the evictions. Um, and I was just curious more how you guys were handling that because we're, we're of course seeing it. Uh, the Nevada CARES campus will be a significant opportunity both in the short and the long term to help us address. But um, I was curious how you guys were addressing it. With women yeah. So thank you. I know you've got presentations still to go. I, have the, I haven't fact, even told you about the good me. stuff yet. <laughs> I just wanted to add to that last question. Um, at the CAC, we've been accommodating about somewhere between 10 and 20 women recently. We were up to about 20 for a while there, and now we're down, I think, to eight or 10 as of last week. So any additional, I had some discussions with Kate Thomas last week on kind of the offsite accommodations that would certainly be helpful if, if that can kick in. Yeah, and I know the cold weather combined with COVID uh, is is really making this a, a bad situation even worse. So I appreciate everybody working together to get people shelter. Thank you. Okay, Amber, back to you. 
Okay, um, so on slide nine, um, I want to just add a, two things. There's been two additions um, since we opened. One is a very a mini, a mini, mini clinic, um, medical clinic uh, for those individuals that um, are experiencing some type of medical issues. So they're not, you know, this um, sometimes our guests, the, the easiest, quickest thing or what they know is just go to the emergency room. Um, and so we're trying to mitigate that, of course, because of the COVID uh, situation and the lack of the hospital's capacity, but uh, also because we have somebody there that can take care of their, their medical needs. Uh, so we put that in. So that has mitigated a lot of emergency room visit, visits. And then most recently, um, one of our biggest wins in the last week is we now have access to the state's um, psychiatrist. So if we have a, a, a guest that is experiencing um, a, a more intense decompensation or stress that our mental health counselor can provide, we now um, can go right up the hill and have them see a psychiatrist. So that is a, a significant addition uh, to, to the campus. Both of those things limits time um, transporting, but also keeps them out of the emergency room. And I think that that's something um, that we need to do for the community, especially during this time. Um, slide 12, um, or wait, let's see. Sur so service barrier removals, you can see one of our dogs. This is the kits that they get. Um, they, we partnered with Washoe County Regional Animal Services. Uh, microchipping kennels are available for them. They sleep right next to um, their owner. And um, this wing is always full um, and has brought a ton of happiness um, to, to this building. Um, so we're happy that we're able to provide it. On slide, the next slide, you will see um, one of our ladies um, that <laughs> loves, loves being at our place and um, the really the the ability for her to have um, a pet uh, let her make the decision to come off of the river so a very unsafe um, environment so when we see uh, situations like this that we can solve a very I think a very small barrier a pet is a is a small barrier in the overall scheme of things if we can do that and get her to a safe place then you know we want to invest in that The next is just uh, possessions. Uh, so Mayor Lawson had brought up, um, or maybe Councilman Dare, I'm forgetting now, um, about possessions. So you will see that there's stuff, you know, we need it to fit in to the wardrobes. You can see how much pride, many, many cubbies or rooms, bedrooms look like this. They take a lot of pride in their area because they are um, design or designated to one place that they stay at during the duration of their stay and don't have to move to multiple beds um, night after night. You can see that um, they find a lot of uh, safety and belongingness um, when they can when they can put their area together. And so they've been very excited to um, decorate their rooms. I won't go into, because um, I know we're, we're probably getting short on time, I, I won't go into the service barriers other than um, to also let um, the, the board know that we hired two eligibility workers. Uh, this was a piece that we talked about a couple of years ago around Medicaid and having insurance and um, employment and all of those types of things. And just to let all of you know that we are using the good grid um, database. It has 81 unique data indicators, and this is why um, this analysis was able to be put together and how we're monitoring. Um, it is critical that we are measuring our progress every single week to make sure that we're making the right decisions, um, and GoodGrid is allowing us, uh, us to do that, and it it's the reason why we have all of the, the outcomes and the data that I'm going to pre present to you next. Um, so, and then um, of course we talked about the diversion case manager, that's for all of the individuals who come to our place that we don't have a space for, um, they're getting assigned a diversion case manager, which is really important because we can start the engagement process before they come into the campus. So uh, just a timeline, um, this has been an interesting nine months. Uh, so during a pandemic, uh, we brought in all of the women in early June um, from Washington Street, all of the families uh, moved over 
um, from the Community Assistance Center in June. Um, and then, I'm sorry, the families went in in June to our place and then all the women came uh, to our place in August. And so I think when I show you the next um, indicators of outcomes, we have seen some significant outcomes in a very short amount of time, but I wanted to give the board some um, demographics. Uh, some of them have already been asked about and discussed. So you can see for, uh, since we opened for women, so this is August, 2020, we've served 176 women. 93% um, of them are uh, identified as chronically homeless. Uh, so sometimes many, many years um, experiencing homelessness. 64% uh, of them have self-identified disability, physical or developmental um, or mental health issues. That is a very, very large number um, and it's untreated and we need to spend a lot of focus on uh, what are the resources that we need um, to infuse because of these very high numbers? 45% uh, of them identified as substance abuse. 15% um, have exited successfully. So that's back to exited to another permanent living arrangement or other program. Um, sometimes a successful exit doesn't mean they're going to live independently, but they are going to a higher level of care sometimes um, that meets their needs or they're going into a crossroads program or something like that. And then what we're most excited about is that 40% of the women are on track to exit in the next three months successfully. And this is where I'm talking about the churn. If you have enough entries and exits at the same time, um, then you're not gonna start seeing the need to keep adding more and more beds um, throughout the community year after year. So slide 17. Uh, talks about just so you can see the breakdown of age group. I'm sorry, go back up, Ashley. <laughs> 16 just shows you the just the breakout. So you can see that um, the 54, 45 to 54 is um, that's the highest age group that we have. Um, but uh, we have all all age groups at pretty high numbers. Um, you will see the 25 to 34. Um, is pretty low. And then of course the 18 to 24, this is because Eddie House just opened um, and we're starting that pipeline. They opened in August or October. So you, we'll start seeing that number increase as well. So the next slide, going on to families, we've served 66 families uh, since the opening. Again, families moved over in June. So they've been there a little bit longer, certainly um, for six months. Uh, we have to, we have a 63% success rate uh, for those individuals. 53% of the families um, have identified as substance abuse and 41% mental health. So not nearly as high as the women um, in those categories, but high to be con high enough to be concerned about because remember a family includes children. Um, and so this is um, this is a, a good system for overlapping with our child welfare division within HSA um, to figure out how we are going to prevent those kiddos from coming into care and removed from their parents. So there is a, a, a different intensive approach that happens um, with, the, with these families. So um, good for a child welfare intersect so that we can figure out what we need to do to stabilize them. You will see on the next slide, the total families exiting out of our place, there's been 38, and the total families currently residing at our place is 28. What we have seen, because uh, we also were the case managers for the family shelter down at Record Street, is that we've had this very, this decade long wait list for families, um, anywhere from eight to 15, families at any given time uh, that are in need of housing. And so that's really the goal with 8B above is to add 10 additional family rooms for those individuals so we can get rid of that wait list. That's a, a very um, risky, um, highly vulnerable uh, scenario when you have parents with children without shelter. Um, and so we wanna figure out how we intervene and pivot to get away from those scenarios. Slide 19, just so you can see the total number of children served, 113. Um, then adults, you'll see there's a total of CPS families. This means that they have an ongoing and um, uh, you know, a, a 
co-occurring case on the child welfare side, which is great because we're under the same um, umbrella. And then you can see the ones who have employment, um, gained employment since they came um, in the program. One of the areas I was talking about as we start um, getting all of this data is there is a, a, a new problem or trend that we have in that we have a multitude of individuals that are in the women's dorm who um, are expecting a child. And we have the family homes that are full. And so once that individual has a child, um, she can't relocate over to the family home because there's no room. Um, and this is not something that, that we would have um, probably expected to see at such high numbers. Um, and so we are responding to that. That's why the data is so important to figure out how we're going to respond to that uptick uh, because we certainly don't want to uh, give someone no shelter as soon as they have a baby and are no longer eligible for the women's dorm. So um, it's just something that we have to be aware of. We're responding to it. Um, but it was a little eye-opening to see the numbers be so high um, and what we need to do for, for when they're no longer a single individual and, and um, within a couple months they become a family. So the <clears throat> next steps for us is um, we are trying to do in 2A where we were gonna do overflow, we are going to do a medical clinic um, that we are going to share with the state as our give back with them. So on-site medical, behavioral, and dental. Um, so a, a bigger clinic than we have with just our APRN, who's amazing in every way um, and helps our guests um, with anything that they need. Uh, but we're going to expand this to a more robust um, one-stop shop. And then, of course, the building expansion for the 10 additional families. We did get uh, CARES dollars uh, through Governor Sisolak's office. Uh, we decided to apply um, in at late November. Um, and we have two, two and a half weeks, I believe, to get this place up and running. And we are going to meet the deadline. And um, I, these are just pictures of the facility. So um, I. I feel really strongly about the environment that we have created uh, for, this, for this population and really any population who doesn't have a home of their own. There has been a significant amount of research around um, how someone's behavior responds to the environment that they are in. Um, and this has been done in research from prisons across the world to nursing homes, uh, to jails, um, any type of environment, the more, um, bright and welcoming and cheerful it can be. It has a tremendous impact on someone's mood um, and attitude and behavior. Um, I know it does for me too. Um, and so if any of you are ever interested in watching um, a TED talk uh, called Joy, um, it is, it, it's really um, what uh, this, this campus has been built around. Um, I do many tours at this campus. It is always clean. It is always put together. They take great pride in it. Um, they feel safe. They want to have better things. Um, they're appreciative. Um, and so I just wanted to show you some of the areas of the bathrooms and kitchens. And, um, and then an exciting addition is our child, our playground is finally up and running um, now that it's freezing out. Um, but the little kitties don't care. Um, they have been um, yelling at Q&D's construction for a very long time, going out there, putting their hands on their hips to asking when they're going to be done with that thing. Um, and so they are now um, out there every day. It's beautiful. The daycare center is beautiful. Um, it's a, a great donation that we received from the Pennington Foundation. Um, I can't wait for all of you to see it. Um, it's, really, it's really something quite amazing. And then just finishing up with some additional, you can see the therapy room, conference room, um, each entryway of the homes, and then the signage that's all bright and colorful and welcoming. Um, I will just end with, um, this is probably one of the greatest things I've ever been able to, to lead. Uh, the staff from RISE to HSA staff are the happiest, cheeriest, most helpful, the biggest hearts I have ever seen the stories I hear 
Um, it, it, it is truly inspirational. Um, the HSA staff, the caseworkers, there is, there is no one like them. Um, they go to the ends of the earth for, the, for these guests. And um, I think it's not only about case management, it's about good supervision and leadership and a model um, that you um, are striving to achieve. And you need to have all of those pieces. And so without um, their dedication and hard work, we would not have the outcomes. You can have a beautiful place um, and you can hire as many people as you want, but if you don't have the right people working um, with these guests and individuals, you can't build trust and you, and you can't have forward progression. So my hats are off to them. They have made this possible. Um, it's exciting to see what we've done so far. I look forward to the next six months. Um, thank you for letting me share uh, our outcome so far. I'm inspired and I'm, I'm feeling good and reinforced about where we're going. Um, and I look forward to uh, the CARES campus and, you know, um, what happens there. And, you know, we're here um, to be a partner in what we've learned um, and anything that, that any of you need. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, that was a phenomenal presentation. And I loved the way you laid it out with the graphs and the various colors. And it was easy to read. It was easy to consume. Um, it made a lot of sense. And uh, this should be a model for how all of our data comes in. Um, I think presenting it in the fashion that you did was very, very helpful. Um, I think the only thing more uh, inspiring than seeing that beautiful woman's face with a little dog is probably uh, seeing your passion, Amber. Uh, none of this would have happened without you grabbing it, not just as a function of your, your job that you had to do, but as something that you knew um, uh, you would be successful because your heart was in the right place. So kudos to you. Nice job. It's, Thank you. Uh, very impressive. Very impressive. And you are correct that the lessons um, that you have learned in this process, uh, the pros, the cons, uh, the resources needed to have the positive outcomes, um, those will be instrumental as we work with you and all of the other stakeholders on how the Nevada CARES campus evolves and how it's funded, um, how, you know, the number of people, the types of efforts in what areas, uh, the resources needed, that's gonna be critical. So. Thank you for all of your work and all the dedication of everybody working there. Um, pretty phenomenal. I see a hand, a council member there. I just have one quick question and, and maybe you answered it and I didn't catch it fully. Uh, what do we do with our women who come? It's gonna start snowing, you're full. Did you answer that? I, I, I don't know that I heard. What, what are we doing this winter for that? Uh, I did, I answered it. Um sort of, I think, um, but I can answer it again and say that there's no one place. We've done the overflow tent in the past. Um, so we're not doing the tent. We are either um, paying for an alternative site uh, for women to go to. Um, the families, of course, will go into 8B. Um, we're having churn uh, again with outcomes from the women's dorm. And so that's going to free up some spaces. Um, so it's really a case by case basis. There's a diversion case manager that is assigned to each person that can't get into our place because they're full. And that diversion case manager's number one responsibility is to find um, housing or, or safe placements for those individuals. As Arlo mentioned earlier, there was about 20 at any given time. We're down to around eight or 10. Uh, it, is a, it is a manageable amount. Um, I will tell you one of our biggest challenges, I think, that we have not solved, and, um, and I, I hate that we haven't solved it, is couples. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's just one of those things, you, you build it and you learn and you figure out, you know, we have these pregnant women trend coming up, same with couples, um, but we would, we would work with them as well, just like you know, any other of the individuals. So no, we don't have a location that we're, that we're referring everybody to. Um, so we're doing it on a case by case, but anyone who comes to our place is, is getting a safe place to be for the night. Part, part of my question comes to, and just so we know, because I heard this a little bit a few months ago from on the, at the shelter side is that we started having ladies go over there because there was no room over here. 
Is that part of the answer that you guys are thinking or are you guys doing, I mean, I know in some ways we've kind of split this up and be away at the shelters taking men, but it seemed like we started mixing that again when you ran out. Uh, if is that part of your plan? I just, I don't, I don't want to find out later. I mean, we, we say one thing and then all of a sudden this is happening. I just want to know what to expect and to, to again, whatever it is, it is, we're going to walk through this winter together. So, but yes, no, that's an excellent question. We are not sending them um, to BOA or CAC. We are telling the, we are informing the women that we don't have room and we're giving them other options if they come to us. What I foresee is happening is we need to tighten up the communication between the two um, emergency shelter sites. So if a woman presents herself down at the CAC, rather than having her reside in that campus, um, that the, we make a phone call back to our place to set them up with the diversion case manager, because we can't intervene with those that we don't know that we need to intervene with. So the ones that we know about, we are definitely responding to, but the ones that are going directly to the CAC and we're not getting a, a call about, um, that's what Arlo was speaking about earlier, getting a list um, of those individuals so we can reach out because we can't, we can't intervene with um, individuals that we don't need, that we don't know need intervention. Um, so we have a process and, and a protocol for anyone who, who needs assistance, but we have to be informed that they need assistance and who they are. So I think with what you just said, how do we make sure that happens? And I say that I'm sure everyone's, I'm sure they're on here listening now to this. And so hopefully that's enough encouragement to everybody to make sure we're communicating because obviously everyone cares about these people's lives and we want the best for them. But is there any- Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's, it's, um, it is my responsibility to connect RISE with VOA and we need to have a conversation and a protocol and contact information. And we just need to, um, to smooth all of this out because I, we st I certainly don't want people to be confused and in crisis at Friday night. Um, and, and this is an easy solution. And I think we just need to have a conversation about it. And I'm happy to take the lead to make sure that that happens. I have one more question on that, Naoma. I know you had something to say, but what about anybody you'd mentioned? There are some that don't, uh, you guys do an assessment and they don't pass the assessment to be able to join you guys. What about those that may have a criminal background or, or some sort? So uh, who, who, who are supposed to, is that still you? I did. That, yep, that's still us. That We've had a total of six, no more than six of those individuals. Um, there are some individuals that are saying that they didn't get in or couldn't, that that was not correct. Um, there are six of them total so far that are ineligible for the campus, but, but we are still providing the case management and diversion, and we are still going to find other options for them. Um, it, it's just not the placement's not our place, um, but it's still us, and we are still handling those. And Thank Arlo, you. I think, has some feedback. Yeah, um, we started working last week on improving the coordination, I think. Perhaps there's been mis miscommunication somewhere. Um, we've been receiving on a pretty regular basis women who are saying they're not allowed into our place. So Kate and I started the coordination so they're all aware that they can be accommodated at off-site locations and they don't need to be at the CAC. Um, our population of women at the CAC who, who told us they're not allowed in our place has ranged from about eight up to a high of a little over 20. Uh, last week, I think it was in the eight to 10 range. So um, the teams are working on um, getting those folks information about the services available so they don't need to stay at the CAC uh, any longer. But as of last week, we're still at about eight to 10 or so at the CAC. Great, good. I look forward to that update so we can get that streamlined. Uh, Mayor Lawson. So this kind of brings up for me, you know, and the bill for zero is all about the information and tracking and giving everybody's uh, data in one place. Are we sharing that information in any way, shape or form? Or do we have a central place where even for my hope team that's down on the river and contacting homeless where they can say, hey, I ran into Joe Smith today. Um, he still doesn't want services. Here's the ailments that we were able to, to figure out. 
just so when he does come to you, because we're finding that it takes 10 to 20 contacts before they'll finally want service, that you guys have a jump on it. Is there a place for that where we can centralize yes. Amazing. That was, um, I know that's been your goal for many years. I think that we are there. Uh, Good Grid has the 81 data in indicators. Um, either Good Grid goes into IMS or IMS the other way. I don't really know. I just know that it talks um, or it's getting to a place where it talks. Um, I know that um, the HOPE team is on a personal name basis. And so um, that would probably never happen where they wouldn't be able to get connection just because they work so closely together. Uh, but yes, what you're referring to is being able to go into a system and figure out all of the intervention points, um, what services have they had, who's, who's seeing them, what all of the supports are. So yes, um, that, is, that is, was the sole purpose for GoodGrid, um, was that exact information, point in time, what is this individual's history? Where are they going? And who do I call that knows something about them? Um, and that's why, why we needed Good Grid and then HMIS for the federal funding. And just as a final comment, you know, it's amazing what you've done in six months. Mm -hmm. Truly amazing. The, the program obviously is, is working because of what you're saying, that churn, that, that's the only way it can work. You have to have successes. So amazing what you've done in six months there, Amber, the whole team over there. Thank you. I, I echo that. And I, I know it's a uh, resource intense operation. And I think as we move forward and we look at some, you know, when we start to compare and contrast operations and populations and that sort of thing, we will find, uh, you know, that the needed resources to improve the outcomes um, are more resources than we have likely been attributing. So we, we have to come into this with eyes wide open into an increased level of numbers of um, clients and needs uh, along with the need for increase um, in the resources and the funding to improve the outcomes. I mean, nobody Nobody's just wanting to just warehouse, uh, somebody used that word the other day. Um, you know, we, we want people to move to the next and better phase of their life and that takes resources and that takes money. So anyway, um, thank you, Amber. I appreciate it. Great, great presentation and uh, keep up the good work and, and your passion is contagious. And thank you. Uh, thank you for all that you do. I appreciate that very much. Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Chair, we do not. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like if we could, because they tie together in my humble opinion, if we could jump to item eight before seven, if we could move to the Nevada CARES campus and kind of get an update on status, uh, the, the next steps, um, et cetera, that would be fantastic. Uh, do I need a board action to do that? Or as the chair, do I just get the, do I just get to do that? As presiding officer, you just get to do that. So we will move <laughs> to item eight and it should be noted that we have no public comment for the record, Madam Chair. Well, that, there we go, there we go. So, um, and, I, and I'm saying this maybe more for the, uh, maybe any public that is or may see this. Um, some asked, where did, the, where did the name Nevada Cares Campus come from? And uh, Nevada Cares Campus came through a discussion about um, this, being not only a regional campus that will serve our area, but um, it definitely involved a lot of state uh, participation and um, their support. And I have said it numerous times that uh, uh, our governor, Governor Sisolak, had he not gotten involved, we wouldn't have had this property and we wouldn't be where we are in moving forward with all the great things that we might be able to do on this. And there were so many people that helped with the acquisition of this property. So it encompassed Nevada uh, because it was all of us coming together and it uh, says cares because we care. I think this board has demonstrated that uh, as the community has, and it was also paid for with CARES Act dollars. So um, there was kind of the connection there. So I've had people ask me, so that's the answer. So Arlo, off to you. Good morning, board members. Arlo Stockham, City of Reno. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. I have a brief PowerPoint. Um, really wanted to uh, cover three topics under this agenda item. 
Um, the first is just a status report for everyone on where we are with uh, site acquisition and development. Then we'd like to have a little discussion about um, the outdoor use area and in particular, if the board is interested in sanctioning camping at the Nevada CARES campus, as opposed to requiring everyone to stay in a shelter during the evening. And then part three is if there is direction to proceed with sanctioned camping, a little discussion of how to make that happen and resource that um, facility. So status. Um, we've been uh, in ongoing coordination with really everyone involved in homeless service uh, provision. Um, really appreciate everyone's help and their input. Um, this is fast moving, but I, I think we've, um, we've at least attempted to address all the big recommendations that we've heard. Um, the Governor's Bowl did close last week, so that is now um, in ownership of the city of Reno. I think the reimbursements from Washoe and Sparks are in process. I believe we received Sparks and, and Washoe's en route. Um, Wells Cargo, the second piece of it, um, that should close possibly as early as today or as late as this Wednesday. Um, we did finalize the agreements with Reno Housing Authority. So um, the agencies will uh, be in ownership of both properties by the end of the week. Um, we've essentially completed our preliminary designs and we are in the process of finalizing the budget and the invoices. We anticipate um, by this Friday having all final budget items and sending out our payment request to Sparks and Washoe um, for those budget items. And we are planning to stay within the overall budget that was approved at the joint meeting, although it's going to be tight. Um, special use permit is in process. Um, we don't need a special use permit for the emergency facility, but because this is planned to be a long term facility, um, we're processing it as such. Um, scheduled a special meeting of the Reno City Planning Commission in a couple weeks here uh, to review the special use permit. Um, in terms of occupancy, it's a little bit of a projection um, because um, construction is dependent on weather and COVID illnesses and, and things of that nature. Um, to be safe, we are planning uh, for occupancy by early March. Ideally, it can happen in February, um, but the temporary facility rentals are going to be extended through March 15th. So essentially, that's our deadline for the big move into the permanent facility um, and removal of the temporary tents and other temporary improvements. I'm sure you all recall the basic layout of the CARES campus with three areas, a homeless shelter area, the governor's bowl for additional homeless services, and then the area for future housing. Um, the site plan that I mentioned is essentially finalized, um, looks about like this. It's a just under 46,000 square foot structure, uh, kind of in this, not L-shaped, but you know, three, three legged building um, design. Um, the existing building there, which is a little under 10,000 square feet, um, it's not suitable for living space, but it is suitable for secured storage. So we're planning to use that building for storage of belongings, um, a pretty significant secured bike parking area, and then we'll have lockers for more valuables um, within the tent structure. Um, we have four restroom and shower buildings uh, where labeled on the site plan, kind of right next to an outdoor plaza area with a shade canopy and some landscaping. Um, really the, uh, what I would characterize as bells and whistles associated with the property um, are gonna be budget dependent. Uh, for example, we're putting as much landscape in as we can um, and we'd like to add more as budget permits. Uh, similarly, on the north end, the area of the building labeled uh, service area and future offices, um, that also could be improved to a greater degree if uh, budget permits. But at this point, we're, we're fairly tight on the budget. And then Are you can see the basic route to the governor's bowl. Um, yes, Are I'm not seeing you, but I'm it, hearing you. Thank you. So um, we, we know that uh, the first step um, of many, many steps with regards to this campus was the acquisition of the property. So that was just step one. There's, there's probably hundreds still to remain. 
as we move forward in the, we'll call it the build out or the allocation of space um, for different populations, whether they're, as Amber said, uh, couples or um, that sort of thing. I am guessing, and I'm looking for confirmation that those sorts of discussions will now begin in earnest with all of the stakeholders to ensure that we, um, as we move forward, that we are putting the right things in the right locations to serve the, the needs. Is that a fair assessment? And this is day one of us beginning that outreach to all of the stakeholders, those that interface with the homeless on a daily basis, those that have walked it from our place and understand the what works, what didn't work, um, that will begin today, correct? Yes, it will with the caveat that we have had some of those discussions already at kind of a, a higher level. So absolutely, there's a lot of details to fill in here. Um, the funding with CARES money is, is really the, the facility, the broad facility with a lot of details to be filled in um, as we move forward. Okay. So just a few more slides. I showed you, I believe at prior meetings, kind of some examples of these uh, sprung structures used for homeless shelters. Um, these are four examples. And then uh, the structure itself that we're planning looks like this. And those are the restroom and shower facilities um, out there. And then the interior, there's really a lot of flexibility on the inside of how it's designed and improved. And that can change over time. That's one of the benefits of these structure types. It's pretty flexible. You see some examples ranging from in Toronto. It's pretty, um, pretty basic, basically shelter beds, and that's about it. You see in San Diego, they kind of have bunk beds on the side and some gathering areas uh, within. Um, San Francisco, you see some interior divider walls there. Um, also locker facilities, which we are planning. And then in Portland, uh, an example of some interior improvements that can be added after the fact. Uh, this is a laundry, a laundromat basically uh, in their homeless shelter. So what we're planning initially is again, budget dependent. We're looking at um, constructing uh, walls, interior walls, probably three of them. So we would divide up the space into four areas. Um, the walls wouldn't go all the way to the ceiling. That'll allow the HVAC to work as a single unit and, and keep costs down there. But we're anticipating a pet section and a couple section and then probably a couple larger kind of standard occupancy areas. Um, but all of that can be adjusted um, after the fact as well. So, so Arlo, quick question for you. I apologize, uh, but this is, this is really, really important and probably the thing that I get the most questions on, um, in addition to our ability to kind of, almost like a convention space to kind of move walls and and divide uh, and provide some privacy and security as uh, is needed. Don't, don't we have some COVID um, divider things as well that will be installed in between the individual beds? Because that's what we have in the tent structures right now, correct? Yes, we do. Um, we, we manufactured um, essentially fireproof walls. So they're, they're not unlike cubicles in an office setting um, to separate the beds and have better social distancing. Those are portable. So we plan to move those to the new shelter and in all likelihood construct some additional uh, divider walls. Again, it's fairly simple. They're basically U-shaped walls. Some of the structure, some of the shelters in other cities have uh, you know, purchased um, dividers that are a little more costly and fancier with drawers and shelving and things like that. Um, but we do have those dividers and plan to reuse them. Thank you. And this, this is just, that was just really important for a level of privacy and, and Amber even hit it on the head, the, you know, to have a better outcome. Um, it's encouraging to see that this, this single structure, and we know the whole property is almost 15 acres. So this is just one of a number of structures on the facility and the lockers was the, you know, I had a long conversation with Grant Denton about, uh, you know, the needs and, and what, the clients most would want to and need to kind of see here to want to access it and 
um, and it was right in line with the, what Amber said, having lockers to lock up their ID and and some of their those smaller valuables while also having on property sort of storage for the big items, but the, a level of privacy for their uh, for themselves. So I appreciate this level of detail. And again, more detail comes by engaging the stakeholders. So thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Commissioner Berker. Um, I also like the idea of the barriers between uh, that we have in the tent, largely because we, we anticipate we'll be dealing with additional COVID problems, at least uh, through winter. So, I, I mean, I, I, I heard last night as I was watching the national report um, that we're probably looking till May. I think that's what the general consensus is right now. And, and I think it's really important that we, we make sure these people feel not only secure staying in the building, but that we're making sure their health is secure also. So I really like the idea that the, that the dividers are gonna be put back up. And I appreciate that Arlo is planning to reuse that. And if you look at the San Francisco one, Arlo, I think you can see the lockers, uh, even though I have my new glasses on, uh, I still can't right. totally see that. Um, it looks like lockers off in the distance to kind of serve the different rooms. Is that what I'm seeing or is that an electrical box? It, it is. And the lockers are one of these key needs. Um, really what you heard from Amber on kind of the, the, the key design aspects of our place. We're working to incorporate as much of that in as we can within the budget we have. What I want to emphasize though is the budget is tight. So it's, it's going to be fairly bare bones. You know, we have the storage, we have the lockers, restrooms, shelter, social distancing. We're kind of focusing first on the safety needs and then adding as many um, amenities, if you will, as the budget permits. Um, but certainly future improvements will be appropriate. Um, it's still going to be a, a fairly Spartan shelter structure, uh, given the budget we have right now. So Arlo, before you move on from that, this to me presents the perfect opportunity for us to engage the private sector and the faith-based community to help us with some of these, um, to me, interior things that are definitely gonna contribute to the success <clears throat> uh, of the folks who, uh, the clients that will be here. So to me, we now have the what. We have a what can people help us with this is to me part of the what. So I'm saying that for uh, the Mike Kazmierskis and, uh, and the others of the world who have always said, let me, you know, you tell me what you need and I will help you uh, with the private sector to get there. So this to me screams help. <laughs> Madam Chair, can I just speak to that too? Yes, Councilman Dick. Yeah, I just want to say one of the wisdom parts on our end would be to make sure that we leave those things. There's some things that the public sector and church, and, uh, uh, church community cannot help with, things that we have to do. And it'd be wise for us to, if we can compile that list, but leave things that are doable. And, and I know that might be hard because at first, sometimes the doable seems like it's easier for us just to get done. And then the problem is we'll leave ourselves. I just, this is one thing I've actually done a bit of, of trying to make sure we can use volunteers in the life I've lived but you, you, you almost have to put these together. They have to be organized well enough that they are really almost shovel ready in the words we use a lot of times for people. But if we could do that, man, I, I would go raise that flag as high as we could for some of these things. But I know I'm not the only one. I think we have many people who've already said they wanna help. I mean, the list alone of a hundred and so people who said they supported this of all those businesses, those letters, those are my first database that we need to send this to because they said they love the idea. So let's let them really love it and be involved. <laughs> totally agree. And uh, also, Madam Chair, you know, I spoke to my Rotary Club uh, a few weeks ago and they want to find a way to get involved to help in this too. So, you know, we thought about building tiny homes, but you know what? Building this out makes a lot of sense too. And there's so many things like the landscaping that, you know, we can arrange all that and to do to curb some of those expenses for some of the niceties, let's call them. But the bare, the bones part of it, obviously the cities and, and the county have to do. 
Agreed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I think the uh, interior of this shelter is a great opportunity. Um, we can distribute a list of kind of the, the things we'd like to do that are beyond the budget. Um, additionally, kind of the next part of our discussion item about the outdoor use area and the governor's goal um, would be a very good area for donors to direct funds or efforts. Um, so really, that was the first part of this. Just wanted to give everyone an update on where we are on the development of the CARES campus. I'm happy to answer more questions on that, but then we'd like to move into the governor's bull property and what to do there um, if there are no more questions about kind of the structure or the budget. So Arlo, my final question, and this is again, um, so as to glean from those who are on the front lines, the we, we don't want to spend money on something that is not going to be utilized or helpful um, and we don't want to miss something that is a key thing because we didn't engage the folks that are on the front lines so are we today tomorrow whomever is the point person going to start engaging the folks on the built for zero uh, list that may help us with this I mean that's such a great list of stakeholders um, to identify the the what's and then we start working on the you know the how and the funding and that sort of thing i mean I, i'm just trying to understand how we're moving forward with build out who who we're consulting to ensure we do this right yes this is really the start of that process i mean we've been consulting primarily with the other agencies and the service providers um, but we wanted to have this discussion at CHAB and then whether the board would be interested in, in having regular meetings or we can at the staff level um, kind of have those discussions and bring them back to the board. Um, we wanted to get in particular on the outdoor uses some policy direction from this group before we went too far down that road. Um, and, that's, and that's understood. I guess what, I guess my thoughts and my suggestion is that we get outside of our um, group of folks we're talking with and we consult and engage with those that are interfacing with this population on a daily basis. So the grants, the Lisa Lees, the, the others that understand we can build a grand campus, but if it's not appealing or meets the needs, you're not gonna get the folks to want to access it. So we have to make sure we do it right. And I wanna make sure we're consulting um, those individuals to make sure as we out the gate, we're doing it correctly. So that would, that's my suggestion is that we broaden our consult group of folks. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Well, the, the other kind of key set of decisions that are in front of us moving forward is how to manage the outdoor use area. What you're seeing here is the revised boundary for the governor's bowl property. The area to the north was reserved by the state for future freeway needs. Um, so the, the remainder is about five acres and there are some slopes surrounding the, uh, the ball field that kind of limits the usability a little bit. Um, we feel we have the, the basic um, structure and layout of the shelter area pretty well identified. Um, as discussed previously, some interior improvements and other um, niceties to be added. But we really haven't done any significant design work um, for the Governor's Bowl area itself. And in particular, there's, um, there's kind of a key fundamental question of whether we should sanction camping at this location or require that everyone staying here stay in a shelter. That's the fundamental question. We'd like some policy feedback um, from this group on today. Um, I know I have, I believe Chief Soto is still on the line. Um, I think he wanted to provide some input. You know, this board has heard um, presentations proposing a safe camp. You've heard presentations raising some concerns about operational aspects of, of camping. Um, it's an it's, it's a important but challenging topic. Um, the takeaway for me at least 
is if we are gonna sanction camping in this location, um, having a well-managed facility will be very important, um, both in terms of caseworkers and those types of services, but also public safety, security, law enforcement, those types of issues. So what we wanted to do is just kind of initiate the discussion um, now and get some policy direction on in particular camping or not, and maybe diving in a little deeper, should it be the whole area for camping or a portion thereof, um, other important outdoor uses that board members may have, um, and then probably have a follow-up discussion if there is interest in camping of how we move forward with the management of the, and the resourcing um, of that facility, because essentially it would be an additional homeless service facility if we have a sanctioned campground here. Um, VOA does not have that in their budget for shelter operations to manage camping. Um, so that's really what we have. Um, it's largely a blank slate. Um, we're not, um, with CARES money, building any structural improvements on the governor's bowl. We are extending utilities um, to, to the property. There is a, a restroom for the ball field on the western end of the property, and it's also a short walk to the new restrooms at the shelter site. Um, but this is what we have. Um, perhaps Chief Soto wants to provide a little else to consider before the discussion, but we're really looking for your um, policy direction on what to do with this part of the campus. Thank you, Arlo. And I'm gonna open it up to my fellow members for some of their thoughts. Um, I will share with the board that um, I had lengthy conversation again with Grant Denton about those living in tents um, along the river and along the railroad tracks and um, asked him if, if this were to be um, facilitated, did he, would he find it beneficial? And he uh, resoundingly said yes, because it would, be, it would provide security. And he wasn't just talking about security in the sense that the individuals wouldn't have to worry about as much about their you know, physical well-being, but security in the sense that from day to day or week to week, uh, the unstable nature of being um, removed from where they're currently camping, whether it's in a park or downtown or along the river. Um, so he thought if this was managed and laid out correctly, um, that it could definitely be beneficial. And that's where the comment about the lockers came in too, is that was something that he uh, shared that they found to be a definite um, attribute that would help them to lock up some of their personal items, even in a, in a safe camp environment. Um, and also that will be shared with the board is last week I attended a um, virtually a housing and homelessness conference that involved leaders from Oregon, um, Arizona, California, and Nevada. And it was about their COVID response in a, uh, to homelessness and, and the things they were experiencing. And um, Cynthia with the city of Reno will share that with all of you. And there were some interesting, um, there was some interest, there was some feedback in there with regards to safe camps um, and how they afforded some of the enforcement and cleanup in areas where the tents were popping up all over the cities and uh, afforded a more managed centralized location um, to the point where they were looking at uh, opening more than one because it was proving to be um, successful. So that's my, that's my two cents. Um, I don't need to tell you that I am in favor of this idea. I know it's got some things to work through um, and this would kind of be a pilot program. So maybe I'll move on. Uh, Chief Soto. Hi everyone, can you, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks for having me today. I had a little bit of challenges and, and issues with Zoom, but I, I, I wanna start off by just thanking all of our uh, elected officials that we have on this phone call and uh, appreciate all of your efforts and in, in working towards um, some improvements to our uh, help out our unsheltered population. <clears throat> but I also think it's important that we look back at some of the um, data and numbers and some of the historical data in terms of this population and what it looks like for uh, at least our law enforcement, which we all know is a big piece of this. Um, in terms of calls for service. Uh, so I go back to, I pulled up some data um, 
for the past four years, going back to 2015, in terms of calls for service at our current CAC. Now, this is just calls for service from the Reno Police Department. This does not include Washoe County Sheriff's Office or Sparks PD. Um, and these are only um, calls for service to the our, our CAC that we have been using for the for the last several decades. Um, and in 2015, police responded to uh, the CAC 1,883 times on, these are on phone calls in which the CAC contacts the Reno Police Department um, <clears throat> or there's activity that, that requires a police response. This doesn't have to do with additional responses that we do uh, in and around the campus that is self-initiated. So this, that's back in 2015. Uh, bringing us up to 2019, that number has gone up to 3,151 calls for service, which is about a 60% increase uh, for these types of calls for service over the past four years. Another thing that I did um, was I, I got some, some other high volume call for service areas um, for you to kind of compare that data with. One is one of our local hospitals and one is one of our, our, our busier downtown resorts. Um, and for our uh, hospital, that number is 678 calls for service. And for our uh, resort, that number is 652. So you take about 700 calls and that's the 2019 number, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so the 2019 numbers for a hospital and for um, one of our larger resorts are very similar in terms of almost 700 calls for service. Um, so you're looking at about five times the amount of response just to the CAC. Now, what's important for our elected officials to understand is those are just calls that are generated by the CAC in and of itself. These are not calls around the city of Reno um, that are calls or complaints or concerns from our community, businesses, citizens, our homeless population, um, for the rest of the city. Um, my, if I had to guess, I'd say that that number of 3,151, if you are, are, are self-initiated responses, is close to probably a little bit over 5,000 responses to the CAC um, as we know it today. So I, I think it's important that you understand the volume that we're talking about. And it's important for you to understand that when the campus is up, regardless of what that vision looks like at the end of the day, whether it includes camping or whether it includes beds and no camping or, or a combination of both, those numbers are going to uh, most likely increase. And in conversations that I've had with our elected officials at the city of Reno, our city manager, um, we have to find a way to address those increased numbers because we certainly just don't have it on the law enforcement side. I mean, when you really think about the volume just for the CAC and not for the rest of the city, you know, all the crime that we have to address in the city and all of the homeless issues that we have to address throughout the region, that number is going to increase uh, extensively. The second piece that, that I think we all need to be aware of, and I heard uh, Chairman Jardin's um, comment about um, the camping and whether or not it, how it provides a safe environment. Um, <clears throat> part of the challenge that we have learned uh, from the Reno Police Department is that this population is about 95% service resistant. So when we come across people that are camping on the river or on the side of the road or anywhere really in, in this region, most of them don't want services. Um, and it's a lifestyle that, or, or it's a way of living that uh, sometimes they choose that way of living. Sometimes it's, 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 a, it's circumstances. I mean, there's just so many different things that lead into that. So we really started asking ourselves, okay, why is this population service resistance, service resistant? Why don't they want, you know, some resources that we have and that we can provide? And there's a couple of different reasons that lead into that. But one of the bigger ones is, and you have to ask yourself this question as a, as, a, as a chairman or a council person is if I'm, if, if I live on the river in, in a tent, um, would I choose to live on the river in that tent or would I choose to live on a campground at the governor's bowl 
um, for safety measures or whatever reason it might be closer to resources closer to uh, maybe um, meals and things that you know essential services that they have to have and I don't know what the answer to that is I think um, that you'll get a certain portion of that population um, to 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 partake in something like that but I also think that you'll have a large population that won't um, and we've had conversations in the past about ordinances and what those ordinances look like. Right now we have ordinances that, that really don't allow people to camp on the river. Now that does, doesn't mean that they haven't been. And one of the challenges that we've had is we have to have beds available for those people to sleep in if we're gonna ask them to not sleep on the river. Um, I believe that this CARES campus will, will answer those questions and it, it will address that piece of it. We will now have the bed, state, bed space for this population. Um, but does that mean that that everybody that's camping anywhere other than the river um, is going to, you know, camp either at the governor's bowl camping ground or on, uh, or, or will they just camp wherever they, they, they decide they want to camp? And that's where the ordinance piece comes into it and something for all of us to think about in the future is what do we want our ordinances to look like so that law enforcement, if you're, if you're asking law enforcement to uh, look at this and address some of this, what type of tools do we have um, to help this population get into um, a safer environment um, than, than what they're currently at? Because we all know that the challenges right now with the environment is health and sanitation. Um, <clears throat> it really doesn't exist in, in that type of environment on the river or on the side of the road because they're just, they don't have the facilities. Uh, and then the safety piece. Um, I think that those calls for service, the numbers that I shared with you with this new campus are going to go up quite a bit. And I've had conversations with our city manager at how to address that. There's going to have to be a lot more private security uh, than what we currently have. Back when the CAC started, we didn't have a lot of private security. And if you remember back then when we had, and, and I'm just using the term that we used back in the day, a tent city over there by our, our, our current CAC, um, we didn't have a whole lot of security and there was a lot of challenges there. There was a lot of crime there. And eventually they, they, they dismantled that. If we're going to have that type of environment, um, right now we have a certain amount, a threshold of security that we have in place. Um, I think that number is going to have to go up. I, in fact, I don't think I know it will have to go up because it'll be a lot more ground to cover and a lot more um, people and, and individuals to look out for. So those are just things that that all of you, um, I just wanna make sure all of you have all of that information and under, understand what an undertaking this is going to be. I know that I've heard a lot of conversation on some of these CHABs that I haven't um, been a part of that talks about this population, um, but I don't know if they understand quite the volume it is that we're dealing with. Um, when you're talking about at least five times the amount of calls for service that we that we would respond to a hospital that gives you an idea and that has nothing to do with anything other than the CAC it does not address the homeless issues throughout the rest of the region you are talking about an overwhelming amount of calls for service uh, that are generated uh, with 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 this with this subject so it's going to be a big undertaking I'm ex, you know I, I I'm not saying that we we're not going to be able to do it because I believe that we are but I think that all of you need to understand um, or better understand or maybe you already know just just what an undertaking this is this is really going to be regardless of how you decide to move forward and with that I'm, I'm, I'm free for any questions thank you chief and and i i appreciate that that's you know having going in with eyes wide open i think is is really important and and your officer's perspective uh engaging with this population um, I'm going to spin it a little bit, though, and say, I think maybe we're looking at it from the wrong side of the lane. Um, I think by engaging the right people to put something like this in place with the right parameters, uh, and again, having watched that conference last week, the way that they kind of divided up the populations, um, to help mitigate some of the issues you're talking about, um, they found some successes. I'm not, I'm not saying this will be successful. I'm not saying it will be a failure. 
I'm just saying to continually um, displace individuals and their belongings and shuffle them from location to location without an alternative for them to be in their tent to have some level of services and security is not been effective. And uh, you and I both know the volume of complaints and concerns we have. Uh, it's the number one complaint coming into the city is the volume of tents and the homeless issues uh, in our parks and along our river and in our downtown. And to not come up with a different way to approach this and try something different is not doing our job in my opinion. So I'm, I'm eyes wide open for sure. Um, but I think we need to engage the folks that are on the ground talking with these individuals that have the, have the interpersonal relationships uh, and the trust um, to help um, those folks living in unsafe conditions along the river understand the benefits. This isn't something being done to them. It's actually a benefit to them. And I would hope they would want to be here for all the variety of reasons of bathrooms and running water and food nearby and a community with some level of resources and management, which they're certainly not getting along the river. Yeah, so, I, um, I would certainly agree with you, um, Chair, Chair, Chair Jordan. Um, I, I think we do need a different approach. Um, what has been happening, we just, it's, it's, it's not working. And a lot of it has to do with the, 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 the number of, of individuals that are faced with homelessness. It's, it's outgrown our capacities that we currently have right now. I, I think what I was trying to get at, and maybe I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't do a good enough job explaining the challenges is, and hopefully all these individuals that you bring up are able to convince this um, population to use these services. That's gonna be the tricky part, right? If I'm a homeless, if, I, if, if I'm in a homeless situation and I have a, a tent that I'm living in because I don't have anywhere else to go. What's going to um, convince me that the governor's bowl is a better than the corner of fourth and, and Galetti? Um, it's just a question. It's just something that I'm putting out there. I think that's one of the challenges that we're going to be faced with as a community. Um, and that's the piece where I'm where I say, you know, if we get creative with ordinances, and I know that we've been looking at them for years, um, we might be able to help out on, on that end. But I would agree with you in that, yeah, we do have to look at it through a different lens. It has become, well, just look at the calls for service. In 2015, we had 1,800. Uh, in 2019, we had 3,151, which is a 60% increase. That's a big challenge. That's, you know, we're, we, have to, we have to change something in order to, to make the situation better than what it currently is. And, I, and I'm with you. I get all those phone calls. Absolutely. And, and like the, um, the email will be going out shortly to everybody, including you, Chief, and, and all the managers, as well as the CHEB board. Um, there were some really good nuggets in this uh, uh, conference last week that, you know, we're, we're not alone in these struggles. We're not alone in the silos. We're not alone struggling through COVID and trying to find creative solutions. Um, but we can learn from them. And now we have some contact information um, in addition to those that are interfacing with our houseless population on a daily basis as to what would be appealing and and I would say the first thing is that you know there's places that they're not supposed to be camping and uh, this and they're being constantly moved from those places and this is someplace where that wouldn't happen and there would be more intensive sort of contact for all of the underlying reasons that maybe got them where they are in the first place so that's going to take resources I get it and you guys I know this is a heavy lift it has been a heavy lift for decades and Reno has shouldered this so 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 much um, and you're right, we just have to look at this differently. And I think this is a um, something to do uh, that we can maybe try, uh, but we wanna try it in the right way. Okay, I'm gonna open it up to the other board members. I just feel very strongly about this, so. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Commissioner Berkeley. Thanks. Um, you know, I, um, I, I, I would be curious if the sheriff had, I mean, I'm sorry, if, if Police Chief Soto <clears throat> has um, a sense of percentage of people that you have worked with uh, who are camping on the river who are going to be, shall we say, recalcitrant about moving into the, the tent city that we're looking at here, or if they might be at the same time okay to move onto the campus 
if we gave them, um, if we allowed them to have their own tent on the campus, for instance, rather than, I mean, they'd have access to the restrooms. And then maybe over time with the team of people who are gonna be working with all of these people, um, they would be more comfortable accepting services. I think we all know this is not just a problem here in our community. This is a national, probably an international problem. And, and we all know we're always gonna have some homeless with us because some people just choose to be homeless. That's what they wanna do. But at the same time, the far not many numbers that we're seeing, I, I can't imagine that those are people who just wanna be homeless. And so would, would, do you have a sense that if we say simply pass ordinances that say you can't camp on the river, and then we say, but here's where you can camp. You can take your tent and you can put it up in this shelter area where you'll have access to you know, bathrooms and you'll have whatever. That people might be willing to say, okay, I can, I'll do that. I'm not gonna go live in your dorm, but I will live in my tent on this grounds. What, do you have a sense that there'll be people who will do that? Thank you, Mr. Bigler. Yeah, I do. I think we do have somewhat of a sense so in, in, in working with this, um, this challenge for the past uh, five years as chief, but really 20 years, um, 20 plus years as a renal police officer, every population has its own logistics and dynamics and, the, and the, our unsheltered population is no exception. I think there is a, um, a portion of that population that has told us, our officers, our social workers, our most workers, that they're afraid to camp, let's just use the river as an example, or a certain area of town um, because of members within that population that are either bullies or, you know, that, that don't treat them right or they're, they're afraid for their own safety. So I think that that population, the more vulnerable unsheltered population probably would love nothing more to be than to be in a safe environment, but outdoors, so on and so forth. I think there's other populations and other dynamics within that who don't want to follow rules, um, who have absolutely no um, intent on being anywhere other than where they want to be. Um, so so I, I, I do think that there is a, a portion of that population that, that will utilize services. And then there's probably a larger population where it's gonna be more challenging um, for them to utilize those services. And that goes back to what I was talking about in terms of you know, ordinances, ordinances and things of that nature. So right now the ordinance, in, at least in the city of Reno, and I think it's similar in, in Sparks and, and even County, is that you can't be within a certain amount of distance from the river and you can't camp there. That has to do with cleanliness, keeping the river clean, safety measures, all these different things that are frustrating to a lot of people. Um, but we don't have that ordinance throughout the entire city and throughout our entire region. And now that we have this campus that um, I, I think I heard earlier is it's five acres um, and we have all this space, that might be something that we want to address and look at, which is, look, if you want to camp, um, we, have, we now have, you know, if, if that's the route you want to go, there's a location where you can camp. Um, otherwise, you're, you're going to have these dots all over on islands throughout the city, which makes it very challenging. Now, if we did change those ordinances and we said that this is the only place and we, we sort of um, were able to con convince a population that we want you to be safe, we want you to be healthy, we want, we want you to have resources. I just wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page that that's gonna be a, a very big lift for for not just for law enforcement, I think for this whole idea that we have on um, on trying to have an effect on this through um, through the you know the the women and, and children's at, at our place and through this new campus on uh, at the Governor Bowl site and and for our homeless challenges, it's going to take a lot more resources and I think we need to understand that moving forward and just say, look, we, we're, we're, we're gonna have to put some more work into this in order for it to make it work. I know that was a long answer to your question. So I think a portion of the population would choose to use that because they'd be in a safer environment. And then I think the ones that don't wanna follow rules um, would not. 
Well, I, you know, I, I, I go without question. I think you're right on. I, I mean, you're, you're in the trenches doing this all the time. So I, I think you really understand that there's no, and I trust your opinion on it. There's no question that you, you're right on. I think you, um, you guys have such good perception, but I'm, I, I, and I do think there's going to be a cost associated with this. And I understand Arlo's concerns about, um, you know, there's only X number of dollars. That's government. That's the way government operates. We've got X number of dollars. But at some point, aren't we going to need to say the answer to camping on the river is not only no, but hell no. You've got a place you can go camp, go camp there, or, you know, you're going to get whatever we do. I mean, I, I hate to say arrested because then we just put homeless in the jail and that's certainly not an answer to the problem. But I mean, somehow if we're able to get as many as possible off that, off the not good places to be camping. And of course it's not just the river. Um, you know, it's, it's any open space. There are lots of them over by the county office and, you know, along the freeway, along the railroad tracks and stuff like that. And, and so there are lots of areas, but I guess, I guess the question is, how are we going to address the, the people who refuse to go in the shelter if we don't address the people who refuse to go in the shelter? And what, how do we address that? That, that I think is uh, the dilemma probably for all of us, but it's certainly a concern for me. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the answer to that is <clears throat> for the past five years, um, as this increase in population came into this region, um, and, and a lot of it is, we have to remember this, is, is our population. These are people from Reno that maybe fell on hard times, lost their job, um, lost their homes. Um, so, so a lot of this population, I know that a lot of people like to think that, you know, we just have all these people filtering in from all over the place. And, and some, there's obviously some people move from, from town to town, but a lot of this is our population. And for the last several years, the CAC, if you've ever been by our our, our current CAC is small. There isn't a whole lot of space there. There isn't a whole lot of room there. Um, so the bed space, when we were dealing with issues on the river and camping on the river was a really challenging topic because we could not take somebody, we, we really didn't have any tools to sell, tell somebody, hey, you can't be here because we didn't have anywhere for them to go. Um, this campus will address that piece. There's enough bed space now to where we can become a little bit more, um, I don't wanna use the word aggressive because we've always taken the approach that we understand this population's on hard times. And if you've ever you know, seen how many times we go up and down at a camp and, and tell, tell individuals that, they, you know, that, that we're going, they're going to be moved, um, it's, it's very, very extensive because they don't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. Now we'll have a place for them to go so we can be a little bit more um, assertive and saying, hey, look, here's where you can go. This is where you can you know, get all of your resources in, in one location and in, in one area. So I think it's, it'll be helpful um, for the river portion of this, um, Commissioner Burke Bigler. Um, I think it'll be an improvement from what we've seen for the, for the, for the past several years. Uh, to what degree? I, I, I guess we're going to find out as soon as we have the bed space that we haven't had for a decade. Yeah. yeah. And, and Chief, thank you, thank you for that. And I think the word, I think the word that we are all searching for and the thing that we have not been collectively good at is consistency. And consistency in the, the what and the where. And to me, this affords us that opportunity to uh, you know, have that location uh, be the where. So there is consistency of information and knowledge that no, you can't uh, be camping along the river for the myriad safety reasons why, and the water quality reasons and the bank erosion and environmental issues. And this is the, re the why, but we have, to, we have to do a good job of flipping the script as to why the appeal of the governor's bowl and, and eventually the build out of this campus, uh, when, when um, Amber talked about our place and the churn, you, you could see her in her presentation of the steps. You know, there was, there was expectations, there was structure, 
And there was awards for following some of those expectations in that structure. And it got you to another level. And um, it created this positive sort of, for lack of a better term, churn that she spoke of. Spoke of. This campus is gonna give us that same uh, ability, but we have to um, make it to where those living along the river understand the benefits of it. And, you know, this, the camping to me is something that can be deployed quickly um, to accommodate the couples and the pets and the things that currently we just don't have a, an environment for. And then as the structure comes online um, by March, then, then uh, hopefully the appeal of the benefits of it will appeal to some living in the tents and they'll progress from that. Um, but I think we, we have to be more understanding of the talking with this population. And this is not something that's not manageable. Um, while our numbers, I think, what, what was our latest number? 2,000? 1,800? 2,000 homeless? Um, just for some level of perspective, Los Angeles has over 66,000. So um, this is something we can, we can have a truly positive impact on with this campus. And to me, this is a component of it and, and worth the try with eyes wide open. This could fail, but I'm hoping if we do it right on the front end with the right structures and oversight and management and uh, amenities, that make it appealing for those that we can make it successful and a step on the ladder um, for our houseless population. I'm glad that you that you bring that up, and, and, and that is one piece that um, there's a lot of things that all of all of our elected officials and everybody who's been involved in this process did. There was very I had huge concerns in terms of where was this going to be located. You know, I had heard things way down south, and east, and west. Um, but the challenges with a lot of those, those areas were that is not where this population resides. They reside pretty close to the governor's bowl, to be honest with you. So location wise, I think we nailed it in terms of having a, a bigger shelter in a better place. And then the amenities piece, you know, a lot of the, the, the challenges that we've heard from our unsheltered population is I don't know what to do with my pets. You know, I don't want to be, um, taken away from all of my belongings, the only things that I own and have. And I think that this new, this new location and the space is really going to help out a large piece of that population. So there's three things right off, four or five actually, right off the top of the bat that this will address. Um, and, and that's a really, really good thing. We haven't had that in place ever. Um, and that is something that I didn't bring up earlier. And that is if I have all of my life long belongings, the only things I have left in this world, but I don't have any place to, to, to secure them or store them. Um, I, I, I certainly don't want to leave what I, all that I have left and not have any place to, you know, to keep that or look after that. So I, I think that this site addresses a lot of those issues, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue to beat the drum in terms of in order to, to manage this, um, it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and it's going to be a lot more than the 5,000 calls for service that, that we currently have. So, um, but I, I agree with you. I, I think that's an important, important piece. And the consistency, this is, this is consistent. This is right where we want it. If you, if you look at where the, our, our, you know, the, the women and, and children have the shelter, this is all in one logistical area within our community. We have all those resources together. And if I'm somebody who doesn't have a home, I know that I can go and get resources and services here. And I know that if I go here, I can get back on my feet, get a job, affordable housing, all of these things I think need to be brought into this. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, but we have, now we have the, the base. Now we have the, the, the headquarters, if you will, of, of housing all these different resources for this population. Um, and that's a really, really good thing. We've been dotted all over the place. That was one of the challenges that I've been saying for the longest time is you've got 20 different sites where people are getting resources and food. And, and how, do you, how do you bring it all together? I mean, how do, you know, you had people walking miles and miles a day with no shoes. Um, how, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? And part of it is you put it in a location in an area where you can put all of those resources together. And we can start working on the back end of this, which is getting people out of homelessness, 
and having jobs and having you know affordable housing and having family members and and, and community people helping them out of their 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 current situation thank you for saying that chief and certainly and and i'll get off this and other board members just kind of speak up i can't really see your i can't see your faces so i don't know if you want to talk um one of the so, things i know one of the challenges so, that those in the green view where there we you can go. see everybody oh, there you go there you go um, is those that want to provide some level of service to this population, um, whether it's mental health service or medical or any sort of support, um, it, they were, you know, it's very difficult because they're at one day they're at X location along the river and the next day they're gone and they don't know how to follow up with some of that care and they lose uh, contact and, and then you're having to start over again. So I, I think there's attributes to this for sure. If done correctly, I think it can be successful. Um, and we have, this board has been pretty courageous um, in trying some new things because the way we've been doing it uh, is not working. Um, and, and acquiring almost 15 acres was a huge step in transforming the way we serve this population and its impacts on the community. Okay, I have totally sucked up a ton of air on this topic. Um, any other members have any questions or comments? I clearly feel passionately about this. Uh, Mayor Lawson. So, Chief, I'm just curious. Uh, I thought part of the reason for the canvas and separating the women and the children and was to uh, do away with some of those conflicts that occurred at the CAC. Uh, I'm curious, in the last six months since that occurred, has, has your calls for service at the CAC dropped tremendously or not at all? Or I mean, Plus, you just don't have as many people down there. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for the question. Um, the women and children piece, it has helped on that end, right, for the calls for service that have to do with that, that portion of the population. Um, but there's a much larger portion of that population that you and I are both aware of um, where the calls for service haven't decreased. Um, they've increased because that population's increased. And um, from what I've seen and from what we've seen, um, that hasn't slowed down. Um, it's been pretty consistent. Um, I'm just going off of data. I'm not going off the number of, of homeless individuals, but the calls for service kind of paint that picture for me and for us and, and our profession and law enforcement. So 2015, you got 1,800. 2016, uh, you jump up to 2,069. 2017, it really jumped up to uh, 3,000, and it's, it's, it's held that for the last two years now. Um, so the population itself has increased, which creates those calls for service. Um, and it's been logistically challenging. I think one of the things that this will help with the, with the R place where it's located now, and then the new campus, the CARES campus that we have on 4th Street is it's all centrally located. So that helps me logistically um, and, and your chief logistically in terms of, okay, now we have this this, this population, it's within a, a logistical area within our community um, and we can address it with, um, I guess better coverage would be the word. Um, but I haven't seen a significant drop. I, I think with our place, I don't know what their numbers are, but it might be like a, a hundred or so uh, homeless persons that we've gotten into, um, into their shelter, but also historically, um, the calls for service with our with our women and children population that are homeless is very low. Um, the calls for service that we really get is from our male population. Um, many of them are on their own. Um, they don't really have any family. They have friends, but they don't have a lot of family with them. Um, and that that is still consistent. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm curious too. I don't Amber Cater still on the line, but uh, have we had any calls for service at the R place in the six months we've been open? I think they, I don't know if they're. I actually think. I don't think they're on. I don't think they're on anymore either, but I actually think that was oh, on it came part on. of the graph. And then the answer was no. And that's what I kind of think. But uh, regardless, you know, I think there's a, a ton of different ideas we can obviously do for this. I think having a place for people to camp is the right thing to do. 
I would still like to see more transitional type housing. Uh, you know, like the, I forgot the name of the place that we built for the, by the community services. H Street, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that's, that's proving to be very successful. I kind of, you know, that type of housing to me is where the solution is in that interim transition between the shelter and getting your life together and then moving into a home and it's still having the wraparound services that are there. I would like to see that Governor's Bowl be that that place where that transition on that those little Hope Springs, uh, uh, you know, houses there. Those are those are pretty cool. We took a tour of that place, and that whole thing works really well. Um, to have somebody, you know, with the, their own space, and, and then they're teaching them the life skills at the same time. All this campus can encompass that. But I think the the first and best use right now is is camping. I don't disagree with you, uh, Ed, and and I think that. I really think we need to do a better job as a region, and I'm not, I'm not saying this in a bad way, but providing some of those, you know, more affordable homes so people can get back on their feet. What I have learned in the last specifically 12 months is that a big portion of this population is, is, is new to this population. And they have, like I said, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their homes, and they, they, they want to have a sense of pride. They want to have a place that they can call home, but they just don't. Um, and, and, and I would I would love to see more of those because they have been very successful. And if you go to those homes on Sage Street and you talk with some of those individuals and they invite you into their home, they're very proud um, of, of the space that they've maintained and, and, and they, they like having a, you know, a place to call home. So um, I would love to see more of that, you know, start showing up in, in, in this entire region because I think that's that's a big piece of it. I think, I think that's where our service clubs and our faith base can help out tremendously in building those homes at a whole lot less money than what they're currently paying for, which I think was $8,500 a unit. Uh, I'm sure that free labor goes a long way in reducing price. <laughs> no, and I, I agree that is a huge component and Sage Street has proven to be very successful and um, you know, emulating that in different locations. I know we are always looking at ways to find property where that's appropriate and ways that we can subsidize. Because even at the $400 a month, there's some that get a government check, but it's just slightly below what their requirement is for uh, getting one of those units. And we, we have to find a way to make those um, available to those, you know, those individuals as well. So I think they're all great suggestions and something that this campus can um, uh, afford us to move forward on a number of those. Um, I don't see any other hands. Um, Arlo, what, oh, uh, Councilman Dare. I've been raising it. <laughs> Raise the roof, I'm sorry. So uh, thank you, Chief. Did Amber, Amber jumped on. Did she want to answer that question just officially? I, I, I saw she jumped yeah. on. Yes, thank you, Councilman. Um, the calls for service at our place in the last six months has been a total of 46, so averaging about eight to nine a month. Uh, but there's a couple of additional things that I think we could share. Uh, we do have Department of Alternative Sentencing that we use for our Crossroads program, which helps with diversion. And then um, we have Capitol Police because we share it with the state um, and some other areas. And then of course, the mental health counselor um, which is um, de-escalating clients and, and security. So I, I offer those things, but it's been 46. So a, a very um, a significant drop than what we were seeing um, at the CAC shelter. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that information. So just, just real quick, and I thank you, Chief, for your perspective. And obviously we, we don't know what's gonna happen if we can move forward on this. And so I appreciate 95%. I mean, I don't, it's hard to know. We're out there too. We've seen it. We've been working in this, but this conversation goes, and I think it's important we take this step by step. And I say that I'm actually typically a bigger strategy chess player than that. But when it comes to what we're dealing with, there's too many unknowns after we take a couple steps. We don't, we don't know what the next couple things hold. And I think it's important that we all really look at it that way in our community that one, we've never worked together like this since I've lived here. I don't know that we've ever worked together like this ever. And so that changes everything immediately. Communication changes everything immediately. That's just on our end. And the one thing we do know is that leadership changes things. It puts order in where there's chaos. And that's 
potentially what I think we're trying to do is bring some order to some of this. And so I just want to tell you, I just, I'm optimistic or, or at least uh, neutral. <laughs> I believe that we can really see some things happen here. But at the same time, you, you, you could be 100% right that there, there's going to be people who don't want this service. Or they're not interested. But the other thing we, I think we have to look at, and I just, uh, part of CHAB is to help those who find themselves in this population without a home. But the other part of CHAB is we have a whole other portion of our, of our population that should be able to go down to the river without a problem and to a park without a problem. And sometimes we don't talk about them, but that is just as important, just as important. No kid should have to walk up and accidentally step on a needle because we didn't clean it up before our kid played at the park. And so these kind of things become crucial. And we've been talking about this for a long time in this meeting. We have to move forward and we have to make some changes because it's for everybody. Yes, it is to help those who found themselves in this situation. And I think we don't change that, that, that language at all. But at the same time, we have to come at this all together with all three jurisdictions, ready to say for those who are not homeless, those, those who do have homes, that we also <laughs> want to make sure you have a safe place for your families. And so, so with that said, I, to me, I think this is, is crucial. I do agree that uh, you're, we're gonna definitely need to walk systematically in a way that we put this in place. We're not just opening up a, a five acre thing and says, where do y'all want to live and that kind of thing. And so if anybody thinks that's happening, please, I'm running if that's the case. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I think Grant, the thing what I saw Grant Denton do down at the river tells me that you can, he, he, he has done an amazing job in just a few months of getting some people organized, focused with purpose and things. Let's, let's bring some of that into the equation. I know that talking to uh, some of the different, from, from, uh, um, from, from rise to different groups who have really been working with this, I think we have some, some real good collaboration and we can do and move forward. The other thing I would just encourage all of us, I, I, I think when chaos, or we don't have the right structure, would you say? I don't want to even call it chaos. Without the right structure, we're going to have people crossing lines and having to call the police and a lot more things. And the more we can bring in that kind of infrastructure around people, and include you guys. I mean, that's the other thing is sometimes it almost seems like, you know, uh, everything we do on the homeless front is separate and then you guys kind of have showed up. Now we've seen with our hopes group, man, we've seen an incredible collaboration together and it's helping so much. And so I even believe that instead of it being a call like you guys are running in to save the day, which I believe me, you're my hero. I think you do do that all the time. But in this population, maybe there's something of a, a relationship that we, we, we keep a constant relationship where you're not, those calls really will drop if we could create a little bit more of that kind of security, that kind of a walking together and relationship. So anyway, obviously those are utopia ideas of things we wanna see, but I, I think we're starting to see some of these things happen. And we have, and, and, I, and I also believe every one of these people are valuable and they have a chance. We wanna give them a chance to move forward. But I, I, I think we're at a place that it's, it's the best answer would be not to have anybody on the river or in the parks and not have to worry about it. But that's not, a, that's not something we get to do. So it's either we find something new to walk forward towards, take small steps, make the best decisions we can as we go, or we just stand still, which I think was what we've done. That's what we've done a little bit. And that, that bothers me, truthfully. I get, I get frustrated. And, and, and so we, we have to find some ways to move forward with wisdom from our police. I mean, I'm not at all this and anybody what anybody said, but I'd say it's worth taking five steps. Let's take five steps. Let's take 10 steps and see what, where we land and then reevaluate and say, what do we need? What do we need to do? And I, I'm a big picture guy, but when it comes to this, I found that the big picture, if we try to say where this is going to be in 15 years, we have no, we, we, I don't think we, we could see it. So anyway, just this encouragement, I, like I said, I appreciate the conversation. We've been talking about this a long time and hopefully we really get to see something move forward. But I would say this though, I think we need to be careful until we have construction and things in place. I don't believe we open anything because we need to be have boots on ground, organiz organized and structured before we bring anybody on that campus though. That would be one thing I would say. Thank I, you. Appreciate, um, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate uh, Councilman Darrow. Um, the, the fact that you talk about the 
for the community um, because that's the community that 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 we in law enforcement hear from very on a day on, on an hourly basis um, and it, you're right they should be able to go and enjoy the river they should be able to go to the park with their kids and 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 I, I'm glad that 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 piece um, was brought up and then the other the only other thing that I wanted to say about what you're talking about is an organized approach um, and, I, and I, I see that starting to come together um, I certainly have more conversations with Sparks in Washoe County more more today than I ever have and that organization is a big piece of it because we all have to we do have to be on the same page in terms of what that approach looks like and how we're going to pass this so but I'm glad you brought up the rest of the community it means a lot to us in law enforcement um, I did get some stats too. So when we had the women's shelter here in Reno, the calls for service were, were very low. Um, there is a different population in, 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 the, in the male population, and that's something that we can get better at. And I think it's people like Grant Denton, as you brought up, that understand and have a, a, a unique approach that works. Um, so maybe we need to find some more grants um, to, to, help out, to help his cause in, in getting these people on their feet. I totally, totally agree with that. And I think, um, I think we're all kind of talking about the same thing and organization and structure and expectations is, is empathy, is caring and is sympathetic. Uh, it's the absence of those things uh, is actually not being helpful or empathetic. I think uh, getting more organized and structured and uh, consistent in our approach is what we've been lacking. And I think this will be a first uh, of many steps that will help us towards that goal, um, you know, and, and having the right people interfacing, getting the right information, making the correct contact with the right direction, um, you know, and not just having law enforcement be that uh, all, all things to all people because, you know, they just, they don't have all of the resources to do that. And, and you know, they, their plates are, are full. Um, but I would also argue that our officers are often put in that position. And if they are not, uh, you know, empathetic and sympathetic and caring, they should not be doing this job. They should not engage with this population if they cannot be respectful and sympathetic. That's a big part of their job. So um, it's all of us kind of rowing in the same direction. And I, I think this helps us uh, get there with, wide, like I said, eyes wide open. It's going to take all of us and resources. And uh, like I said, we, I don't think we need to recreate the wheel. I think Arlo and, and others have done some research. I know I have on jurisdictions that have had some successful safe camps, uh, even very, very recently. And just mine that information and, and see, like Christopher said, how we get some structure and management locked in before we do anything. Because I'm with you, we would be grand failures if we just opened the gates and said, you know, come on in and no rules and no structure and no expectation and no cleanliness and organization. That, that would assuredly be a failure. Uh, Mayor Lawson, I think I saw your hand go up. Just so you are all aware too, uh, we have hired Grant uh, in the city of Sparks and we task him specifically with duplicating himself and, uh, and then working with our law enforcement to develop more relationships and gather more information as we've said for the Built for zero. I mean, that's information is key. So uh, Grant uh, is soon to be a uh, consultant to the city of Sparks. So we're, we're happy to have him. And, uh, and it's, it's unique in his perspective. And Councilman Dare and myself and our city manager went down to that part of the river where he was uh, kind of helping out and getting the cleanup done. And, and there's, I think this camping spot is going to be more popular than, than we know. Uh, just because of the safety along the river. I mean, we, we watched the meth deal go down right in front of us within 30 feet of where we're standing. And uh, it was just incredible. And, and uh, you know, there had been problems I said with- No, I didn't want to buy any. I said, no, Ed, I just want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, so there, there's definitely the safety aspect there. So it, I think this is going to work out. The bottom line uh, is, yes, we do need to coordinate it together. Uh, I think our HOPE team is doing a wonderful job with Grant's help. I think we'll do even a better job. And, uh, and then we're going to hopefully we'll translate that onto the rest of the community as we go forward here in the, after the first of the year. But uh, to just put the fine point on it, we can't just open the gates and say, 
bring all your stuff here in camp. It, it, you have to have an organization. It has to be set up with areas of, of your area. Uh, one thing I found was interesting, Grant told me this story, is that one of the guys that was living down there on the river got a job and found an apartment and he actually sold his camping stuff to another person for $200 so that they moved right in there. And Grant was like, what are you doing in Joe's spot? And, and he's, well, I bought it from Joe because he, he's got an apartment now. So the, the folks down there are quite industrious. They know how to uh, make a dollar once in a while. And one of the things I want to put in your head is there's some places around the country where they actually charge a nightly fee uh, to stay. Uh, Currently on the river, if you're gonna to go to the meth house, it's about $10 a night. I'm suggesting that we look at something like three to $5 a night that helps pay for security and uh, clean up and all the things that go along with a population like that. And because what 99% of or 95% of the homeless population does have some source of income. So that's the uh, two cents from this side of the dais, as it were. Thank you, Mayor Lawson. So Arlo, um, what do you need from this body? It sounds like there is an appetite to move forward. And, and the last thing I would say is making sure that as we move forward and evolve in what this will look like and, and collaborating with our regional partners on helping shoulder you know, the burden of what this will take to do it right, um, just that we're staying in constant communication with you know, the downtown Reno partnership. I mean, I mean when, we, when this goes live, we, we wanna make sure that everybody is, has the same amount of information and giving the same sort of resource or direction. I don't want you know, the Downtown Reno Partnership ambassador saying, well, go to Community Assistance Center to the folks in the tent, not knowing that there's this tent location for them to be. You know, just that everybody's kind of singing from the same uh, hymnal. So, um, so back to you, Arlo, what do you, what do you need from us? Well, what I heard is pretty universal support for authorizing camping, but also not tomorrow to put up a management system um, before that, that nighttime activities opened up. Um, my thinking is kind of a, a coordinated meeting, coordinating meeting with our partners and the various service providers and interest groups on this and probably putting out an RFP for management of a sanctioned campground um, that, and, and see, see what we get. I know, I think it was RISE did a proposal initially. I guess I'd just put out there, um, we over at Reno are incredibly strained right now trying to stand up this shelter. I am wondering if Kate or someone um, could kind of take a more leadership role in putting out the RFP for this doc, this area and kind of helping us um, with the plan. We're just beyond stretched with all the many moving parts associated with the shelter operations and construction. So we, we definitely want to participate. We'll be in that lead agency role if need be, but if we can get some assistance, it would be super helpful in this case. Kate, you're on mute. Uh, I don't know if you have some feedback. I mean, this is us kind of going, please. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Chair Darlin and Arlo. Um, yeah, we are obviously pretty taxed as well with COVID and, and all the other issues, but we will look internally and see what resources we have available to um, see if we can, can have somebody help with that. So, uh, that's encouraging. Thank you. I'm hoping because um, I know Amber and I know her plate's very full. God, she's done such a phenomenal job with she knows the nuts and bolts. Um, I'm not putting this on her plate, but sometimes when you're successful, people look to you to, to do more. Um, so and I know, Arlo, you said not tomorrow, but I certainly don't want this to uh, get bogged down in all of the other emergent things we've got going on, because I think what the the thinking is to, is to get this part uh, activated uh, as soon as possible and certainly before the construction is completed of the um, 46,000 square foot structure. So we have some sort of transitional spacing in, in place. So I, I don't know what the realities are of an RFP, RFQ and, and getting that back and selecting someone to move forward. I mean, 
what what are we looking at? Would by next meeting could we have that completed? Well, it certainly needs to go timely, kind of like everything else we're doing on an emergency basis. Um, I, I think so, but again, it's kind of hoping for someone else to help us with that process. So we're, we're kind of leading up the construction effort and ideally Kate and her team could lead up this RFP and, and the coordinating on the campground area. But yeah, certainly having something back, maybe we could get a proposal, you know, request for proposals out in the next couple of weeks and do a pretty short turnaround for those proposals with the goal of having the proposals back for your next meeting. If I can, Madam Chair, um, before we do an RFP, we have to have an identified funding source for statute. So we just need to start that discussion sooner than later as well. So we can we can look to the managers and our executive level staff to talk about how that would play out so that we can get going on that document. So I guess my question would be, we have a uh, cost share agreement, uh, at least conceptually agreed to, would that not be the guiding document in this regard? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, we just have to look at, it points to the CARES campus for sure. So, you know, I, I don't know that this was specifically on the mind of our elected policymakers when we looked at standing up the CARES campus. I know for sure the, you know, the shelter piece was, but the sanctioned camping, I don't think we've talked about in detail, but I will certainly reach out to them and see what we can pull together. Thank this you. would need to be a, an agreed to addition to our operational cost share. Um, obviously, there's going to be a cost associated with it. If I recall correctly, the the rise proposal previously was in the one and a half million range, but it did not include security. So I do think we're looking at at least a couple million dollars annually in operating expenses for this. So I guess my question is, I would hate to leave this meeting and have subsequent meetings occur and things get in a stalemate um, with regards to this. I, I guess maybe I'm looking to some guidance. We have represented individuals from all of our boards uh, giving United direction on this. Um, is it that this sort of action has to come back to the individual bodies? for approval, is that kind of what we're thinking? Nick, um, yeah. Ms. Chair, I, yeah. I, think, I think probably the approach is, uh, how I think how we would function, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor Lawson, but I think what we would do is say, okay, this is what we talked about here. I know that our city manager and stuff, they'll take it back, chew on it a little bit, talk about what that could look like, and then come, they'll bring it back to each of our, you know, I think they'll do that for you and then do it for county. Because I think what we get to do, what, what I've noticed, which is really great, is a lot of our region is looking to say, what did C have, C is necessary? What is the plans, how's it going? But then I know for us, we still would go back and we would be a vote on our city council, just like you and everybody else. Okay, so okay. I wasn't yeah. sure yeah. how with all, so I guess my, my final comments on this, and I know we've gone long on this meeting, but I think this is really, really important stuff, um, is I know, Arlo, do we only have one more meeting before we go on break? Uh, I, I, I don't want this to wait a month or 45 days before, it, um, before we can do anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sure the mayor would call a special meeting to contemplate this, but I don't, do we have, time to get this quickly on an agenda or is that too ambitious? Um, in terms of a city council agenda, we're too late to get on our meeting for Wednesday. Um, we could do a special meeting alternatively, you know, some, some work to line up the RFP and proposals could probably occur concurrently. So okay. the formal funding approval could come in January more after the process has started. Okay. Otherwise, okay. yes, we would be looking at a special meeting during the holidays. Um, Amber, I saw your hand go up. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to um, add some additional um, content 
around the safe camp. So when there was a proposal for that piece of it, it was 500,000 um, for the operation of a safe, safe camp annually. We've done a, a little bit of work around safe camps across the country and the makeup of them um, and different funding mechanisms. So we'll be happy to use um, that as a guiding um, foundational points for, for the RFP to share, but it's around 500,000. Well, that's better than my recollection. <laughs> Am I remembering correctly, yeah. Amber, that that did not include security? That was really the operational piece without security? You're, you're correct. You had that right. And we do need some level of security, obviously, but also, you know, in talking with Grant about this, that, you know, that can, uh, uh, having too much of a heavy hand on that, we want to keep everybody safe. I'm not suggesting otherwise. Um, but coming off too, uh, you know, aggressive on that side will prevent folks from coming there because it will be uh, viewed in that light. So uh, again, I think there's folks that we can mine some of this information from, um, but I, I like Amber's number a heck of a lot better than yours are though. Jeez. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, do we need to take a, an action on this or is this kind of staff direction and y'all can go your directions? I don't I don't think we can take any action. We're not, we're an advisory board. We just, I know our managers are listening so they can. Uh, okay. It says it. for possible action, which I think we've kind of given all that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Arlo, Amber, Kate, does uh, Neil, Eric, anybody need anything else from us on this item? I, I don't, we'll follow up with discussions with, um, the Washoe team and Sparks team about moving forward on this. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any comment on the side? Madam Chair, we do not. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are moving back to item seven. I did want to ask the board, um, we are over by a fair skosh already, um, and I hate to do this, do we want to skip the vote for zero? Yes, because we, I think that'd be a good idea. We are way over, um, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have another call coming up here shortly. But um, I do think that we have a fairly good idea where Built for Zero is going. And I think moving it to the next meeting to get a two month update might be a better choice since we are continuing to move forward. I agree. And I don't see Dana on here. I, I hate that we kept her waiting and then we're gonna say we're gonna bump it. But. That looks like what we're doing. Okay, also, uh, Madam Chair, keep in mind too, right now it looks like January 20th, we're gonna have another concurrent meeting. So, and we're gonna discuss homelessness issues again. So uh, that you oh, know, we, we can get a lot done in January with three meetings. Fantastic, that's perfect. That's a, that's a good place to discuss this. Um, okay, so we will go ahead and um, continue the built for zero item. Madam Clerk, what item are we on now? Item Madam nine? Chair, we're on nine, item nine, which are updates from the board. Any board members have any updates, comments, anything they'd like to add before we move on? I would just say- Councilman uh, Dare. I just want to say uh, thank you to our Marshal Burke Bigler for all her work. And uh, it's been a joy. And I do know she's not going anywhere. And I do uh, continue to- want to make sure she knows that uh, we'll keep running after all this together, but uh, definitely have appreciated you and continue will. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and Madam Chair, I just want to say thank you all to you guys. It's been a great, great committee to be on. I've so appreciated working with all of you and I think that you are all headed in the right direction. And this is a, this is a population that we really need to help but I think Christopher is right on. We also need to remember that our river's beautiful and our citizens like to use it. And so we wanna make sure our children and our citizens can use it also. So you guys are headed in the right direction and I know you're gonna do great things. Thank you so much. Enjoy those grandbabies and those dogs and that retirement. I'm <laughs> jealous to say the least. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, I don't see any other hands going up to say anything. So we're on item 10. Any closing public comment? 
Closing public comment for this section, Madam Chair is reserved for items that were received after 4 p.m. on the business day preceding our meeting, which would have been Friday. We received public comment by way of submission to this meeting from Carl Murhuo, who is concerned about mental health services for the homeless that has been submitted to the board and is part of the official record. And with that, Madam Chair, we have no further public comment. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd be looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, second. Motion. Second. Third. All in favor? Aye. And a third and a fourth. All right. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Here.